Aside from perhaps the Toyota Prius, I don't think any green vehicle has been as caricatured or as misunderstood as the Nissan Leaf. This is still one of the least expensive electric vehicles you can buy in North America. In this video, we're going to talk about why you might want a Leaf and why you actually might want to choose this over some of the more modern electric vehicle competition in the United States, including Nissan's own Aria. Obviously, the biggest reason to buy the Leaf over the electric competition is its price tag. It starts at $28,040. This is one of the least expensive new EVs you can buy in North America. And for 2023, starting in March, it's not going to qualify for the full federal tax credit, but it will qualify for at least half of it, getting the effective price down to about $24,290. That is significantly less expensive than a Nissan Aria, about $18,900. Now, the important thing to remember is that for 2023, starting in March, that's when the new battery sourcing requirements come into effect for the federal tax credit. So you'll get half the tax credit for this being built in North America, the other half if the battery components come from North America. And at this point in time, we don't know exactly where all the battery parts are made in here, but we do know, for instance, that the Nissan Aria is built in Japan, so it's not gonna get any of the tax credit. The LEAF comes in two different ways. You can get a small battery pack or a big battery pack, and this is one of the smaller battery packs available in North America at just 40 kilowatt hours for the base model. This one has the bigger 60 kilowatt hour unit. If you're worried about resource utilization, if you're worried about lugging around a big battery pack that you're not using, if any of those things are of concern to you, you might want to consider a smaller battery pack vehicle like the LEAF. And of course, it's still a practical hatchback, as you can see with this form here. There are obviously a number of reasons that the first generation LEAF especially turned into a bit of an EV caricature, but the styling was certainly one of those reasons. It looked really unusual up front. This, however, fits right in with the rest of the Nissan lineup. We have the same sort of shapes going on as you find in the rest of the Nissans out there. Pretty conventional LED headlights, pretty conventional design to the lower portion of the bumper as well. Really, the only thing unusual going on here is we have the charge door up front, and we should talk about that now. This this is the location that I actually prefer for a charge door, but I don't live in an area that gets a lot of snow. If you get a lot of snow, you might not want that caked up on your charge door. Now in here we have a J1772 connector, that's pretty normal, but over here we get the only vehicle on sale in America that's a full battery electric that uses a Chatamo connector. The only other vehicle that uses this particular DC fast charge connector is the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid, and let's be honest, nobody's going to be DC fast charging that. I am a little bit sad that Nissan has not chosen to update the LEAF for 2023 with a CCS connector because Nissan does believe in that new standard. You'll actually find the CCS connector on the new Nissan Aria. The Nissan Aria is notably larger than the LEAF. When you look at this from the front, you'll notice that this is not terribly wide, but it is wider than a Chevy Bolt. So that's probably the closest direct competitor to this, especially when we're talking about the price tag. It will also qualify for a portion of the federal tax credit, but starting in March, probably not the full credit either. Obviously, another reason to get this over something like a Chevy Bolt is that this is bigger. We get more rear seat leg room and we get more cargo room in the back. We'll talk about that more in a bit, but this actually has about the same size cargo area as a Lexus RX. Now, this particular model is the SV Plus trim. This is more expensive than the base model. And for 2023, there are really just two trims, S, which has the 40 kilowatt hour battery and SV Plus with the 60 kilowatt hour battery pack. This, of course, has a higher starting price, $36,040, but it is still going to be one of the least expensive EVs available in North America. You can see that the rear end design is obviously less controversial than the first generation LEAF, if you haven't seen it recently. We have these very Nissan taillights, which I think are quite attractive. They have kind of a boomerang theme to them. Partial LED, so the brake lights are LEDs, but the turn signals, those are incandescent inside that module. If you're a fan of EVs with rear windshield wipers, we do have one back here. Like many other affordable EVs around the world, the Nissan LEAF is not built on a dedicated EV platform, like the new Nissan Aria, or like our EV of the year for 2023, the Kia EV6 that's hanging out right next to it. That happens to be the long-term EV6 that we bought here at Alex Nottos and EV Buyer's Guide. We'll talk a bit more about some of the pros and cons and comparisons versus a full electric vehicle like that. But keep in mind, the EV6 is significantly more expensive than the Nissan LEAF. And that's why this was built on some of the building blocks that are shared with other Nissan vehicles to help keep costs low. And that's why under the hood, we find the electric motor. Two different electric motors, actually. The base S trim with the 40 kilowatt hour battery pack will get a motor rated at 147 horsepower, 236 pound-feet of torque. This SV Plus has a different electric motor bumping power up to 214 horsepower, 
250 pound-feet of torque. That gives this one a range of 212 miles on the EPA scale, the base model 149 miles. Now both models use a 6.6 .6 kilowatt hour onboard charger accessible via that AC charge port right there on the front. Some folks have had a problem with that. Something like this EV6 will charge at nearly 11 kilowatts, but only if you have the right EVSE at home or at the office. And 11 kilowatts is an awful lot of power. Enough power that here at home, I only ever charge an EV at 3.3 kilowatts. At the office, our maximum there is 6.6. .6. So to be honest, neither of these vehicles would charge faster than the other when at home or at the office for me. Although the onboard AC charger doesn't get any faster in the SV Plus, DC fast charging does get a little bit faster if you can find the very rare Chatamo DC fast charge stations that are rated for 100 kilowatts in North America. In addition to that change, the SV Plus also gets an onboard heat pump. So in temperatures like it is right now, where it's about 40 degrees out here, this is gonna be much more efficient at heating the cabin than the base version of the Nissan Leaf. It's also gonna get heated seats, which will further help reduce your power consumption in winter weather. And a lot of that is pretty similar to full battery platform vehicles like the EV6. This one has a heat pump, it has heated seats, things like that. So winter weather consumption has actually been incredibly equal between these two vehicles, with the Nissan Leaf eking out slightly better efficiency, mainly due to its smaller size, its very light curb weight, and of course, the relatively skinny tires. You'll have to pardon the beeping. Nissans love to beep when the doors are open, but on the inside, you will notice one of the compromises for a shared platform like the Nissan Leaf. We don't have that flat floor that so many people find sexy in modern EVs. So instead we have more of a traditional center console in here, very similar to what we find in other Nissan products. And that also goes for the back seat. In the rear passenger area, we have a hump that's a little bit different than a regular gasoline vehicle. It's actually a little narrower at the front, a little bit wider at the back. That's just due to some of the positioning of the battery modules in the vehicle. Over here in the EV6, we obviously have the very trendy floor with this floating area underneath. You do get a little bit more storage than you'll find in something like the Nissan Leaf, but it's really not a great deal of extra storage. And to be honest, I very rarely put anything in that storage bin under there. On the other hand, the flat floor in the back, that is definitely an asset. It makes it a lot easier and a lot more comfortable for someone to sit in the middle seat or just move across the rear if they need to. Now don't worry, this is not meant to be an EV6 versus Nissan Leaf video. That would be ridiculous because that EV6 is about double the price of a base Leaf. It's all wheel drive, et cetera. It's a lot more expensive. Instead, my point here is just to show you how practical a Leaf still is compared to a modern and much more expensive EV. Here in the back, we find about the same size cargo area that we find in the EV6, but Interestingly enough, it's actually more practical than what we find in the Kia. This is an awful lot squarer and an awful lot taller, so it's much easier to put bigger, boxier, and bulkier items in the Leaf than in something like the EV6 or a Tesla Model 3, which is gonna be the least expensive vehicle you could buy in Tesla's lineup that you might wanna be cross-shopping against this. Now, there are a few considerations, of course. The Nissan Leaf, being one of the least expensive EVs in America, does not have an active cooled battery pack. It is a passive cooled battery, so it's not water cooled like we find in this EV6 or most modern EVs. If you're interested in that, Nissan has the Aria. If you're interested in all wheel drive, Nissan has the Aria. But because of its low sticker price, there is still a place for the Leaf. As with most modern Nissans, I found the front seats to be pretty comfortable. I like the general design of this seat bottom cushion and back cushion, especially keeping the price tag of this vehicle in mind. This trim has a multi-way power driver's seat with two-way adjustable lumbar support, and the seating position is definitely a bit different than other modern EVs, especially really low roofline EVs. You'll notice that I can sit in a very upright position here, and I have tons of headroom left can actually move this seat to a ridiculously upright position, uh, one suitable for my cat apparently to decide to join me here inside the car. Um, lots of room in here, and of course we have a manual tilt telescopic steering column. The very upright seating position of the Leaf makes it easy to give your passengers in the back a bit of extra room, but you should know that the front seat is still a manual design, and the seat bottom cushion does not adjust for tilt or height, so it's a lot less comfortable than the driver's side. But let's just go ahead and hop into the back seat and check that out. That is obviously a big advantage for a number of modern EVs is the amount of rear seat leg room we get. And in here, you'll notice we don't get quite as much legroom as some of those competitors. I have maybe about an inch and a half, two inches of legroom 
it would be a little bit trickier for a six foot tall person to put a rear facing child seat, especially back here. But if I move over to this other side, you'll see you can still foot fit a six foot tall person behind a much taller person up front. This front seat's moved all the way back in its tracks and headroom is relatively generous for a vehicle in this category. My head does touch the ceiling due to the shape of that hatch support back there in the rear. Uh, but as far as small EVs go, this is definitely a bit more accommodating than a Chevy Bolt. Taking a look around the inside, things are pretty basic on the ceiling. The controls for those reading lights, a sunglass holder, and no moonroof available. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger and height adjustable headrests. If you're interested in imitation leather upholstery, you'll find that elsewhere in here we just get fabric kind of an interesting stripey theme going on there in the middle of the seats. These are heated, but you do have to get the SV Plus to get the heated seats. The regular model doesn't have the heat pump and it doesn't have the heated seats, as I said before. As you can see, bolstering on the front seats is fairly minor, so larger folks shouldn't have any problem with those seats. Moving over to the front doors, lots of hard plastics, as you'd expect for a vehicle with this kind of price tag. Soft touch armrest right there, but pretty much everything else is a hard plastic. Big bottle holder down there at the bottom. The general theme of the dashboard is pretty similar to other inexpensive Nissan vehicles. Same sort of air vent shapes and things like that going on here. Hard plastics upper and hard plastics lower. This uh, trim panel, I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to imitate, but it does have a cool geometric pattern on it. We have a glove box below there. It's a bin style. I was not able to fit a 10 inch tablet computer inside. It's just a little bit too small, but obviously you can put smaller knickknacks in there. We have a touchscreen infotainment system right here in the middle. This does support smartphone integration. And it's running essentially the latest version of Nissan software on a smaller screen setup. Below that, we have the controls for the single zone automatic climate control. I do like the fact that you can turn off the heat mode if you wanna save a bit of extra energy in cooler weather. You can just uh, live with it being a little bit colder in the car. We have the engine start stop button there, two USB inputs for the system, a regular USB and a USB-C, I like that touch. Heated seats for the front two passengers there, driver and front passenger, I should say. Eco button there, e-pedal is what Nissan calls their one pedal driving mode and then kind of a joystick shifter here in the middle park is that button right there on top. Moving back from there, we have two decently sized cup holders, electric parking brake and a fairly small armrest. It's kind of kind of comically small actually right there between the two front seats and a fairly small storage area inside. All versions of the Leaf get this partial LCD instrument cluster. This is something that Nissan's been doing a really good job at in a lot of their inexpensive vehicles. Over here on this side, it's about seven inches or so, and it does offer a wide variety of different information readouts. Also some vehicle settings there, stability and trash control, your trip computer, turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions, readouts from the infotainment system, etc. Battery temperature and battery capacity are two of the more interesting displays that Nissan gives us. If you're worried about how the battery degrades over time, this is one of the very, very few vehicles that will actually have a gauge on the instrument cluster that will tell you how that battery is aging over time. Now, moving out to the steering wheel, we find one of Nissan's excellent flat bottom wheels that makes it a little bit easier to get in and out of the car. It also looks pretty cool. Over here on this side, we have the infotainment controls, volume up, down, track, forward, backward. On this side, we find the radar adaptive cruise control controls. And this, of course, also enables and disables the lane keeping assistance system. Onward performance is obviously going to vary depending on the battery and the motor that you select. If you get the big battery, which comes with the big motor, then you'll go zero to 60 in 6.3 seconds. That was interestingly enough, a little bit faster than the last Leaf Plus that we tested here. Now, if you get the base version, that's going to stretch out to seven and a half seconds. Both of those times, however, are actually quite respectable for anything in the compact category, electric or otherwise. Something like a Nissan Sentra, it's going to take a lot longer than this to get zero to 60. Ditto a Honda HRV or a Hyundai Kona or anything along those lines. Nissan Kicks, definitely slower than any version of the Leaf. So while some folks might say this is not as fun as a Model 3, not as fun as an EV6, you would definitely be right. But you would also be missing the point. This is certainly more fun than vehicles that are logically going to be cross shopped against this that happen to have a gasoline drivetrain. Now, obviously there is a ton of torque coming from this motor, so there is definite torque steer. You'll really feel that in the corners, in the straightaways, pretty much any time you rub on the throttle fully, but it is an awful lot of fun. Also quite respectable is the stopping distance. In this particular model, it took 128 feet to come to a complete stop from 60 miles an hour. That's respectable when compared against gasoline vehicles and certainly respectable when compared against other EVs like Ford's Mustang Mach-E. In fact, when you really scratch the surface, a number of different scores for the Leaf compare pretty well to the average EV. 
as long as you're willing to compare this against base models, not the most fun version of the competition. So versus the relatively short-lived, short-range Kia EV6, for instance, the range here is actually quite good, as is the 0-60 to performance and the stopping distance. Ditto compared against the least expensive version of the Ford Mustang Mach-E. It's not going to have much more than about 220 miles of range, and it's not going to go 0-60 to much faster than just over 6 seconds. Handling is also relatively similar. This may have skinnier tires than some, but the lighter curb weight means that in neutral handling it does quite well. Of course, when you romp on the throttle, you get all that thrust, but you also get all that thrust happening on the front tires, which means it's just going to understeer if you want to drive this more aggressively. But this actually has the feel of a hot hatch at times. If that's what you're looking for, if you're used to, say, a Volkswagen GTI, clearly the suspension is not going to be the same as that, but the amount of thrust you can get is not far off. When it comes to the ride score, I give this an A. On a rougher road surface like the one that we're on here, this is definitely a little bit more compliant than the average compact sedan or compact hatchback. And in that respect, it reminds me a great deal of the Subaru Crosstrek, which also has a slightly softer ride. For a lot of battery electric vehicles, the added weight of the battery pack also helps smooth out the ride a bit, but the Leaf is a little bit different. Starting out at around 3,500 pounds and going up to 3,900 pounds, this particular model is heavier than average for a compact entry, but the difference is not enormous. It's not nearly as large as, say, the difference between a Nissan Sentra and something like a Ford Mustang Mach-E, which on the outside side are really not that far apart in terms of size, but the Mach-E is considerably bigger because its battery pack is much, much larger. In fact, its battery pack in the big battery version is more than double the battery pack in the small version of this. In my cabin noise testing, this model came in at 72 decibels, so pretty comparable to most of the EV competition yet again. And as far as fuel economy goes, I have been surprising myself by averaging 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour in this model. That is really quite good, and it has been definitely cold. It has all melted now, but earlier in the week we had 3 inches of snow right here, 12 inches of snow at the top of the hill, lots of heater use, and lots of driving around obstacles. In fact, the road up there has been closed for a number of days. That's why the vehicle is so dirty right now. I actually had to drive it to the office completely around the road as a 90-mile odyssey to get to the office. I was a little bit concerned at the beginning as to how this would fare in the wintry, colder weather, but at 36 degrees, I was still averaging 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour. That's thanks to the heat pump and, of course, the use of the heated seats, which really helps preserve some of that range. This is definitely more fuel efficient than a decent number of modern long-range EVs because when you start putting bigger battery packs in a vehicle for the longer range, you start dropping the actual efficiency, and that can sort of be a self-defeating proposition there at some point in time. As I've said a number of times before, if you want to double the range in an electric vehicle because of the weight of the battery pack, you have to more than double the size of the battery pack. And that really holds true when you compare the essentially 150 mile range in this Leaf with, for instance, a 300 mile range EV that is really not far off of this when it comes to aerodynamics, drag, etc they will generally have batteries that are considerably larger than this. And when it comes to the EPA rating in this vehicle, it appears that Nissan was pretty darn conservative. And as long as you have the heat pump in your Leaf and you're not driving it at 80 or 85 miles an hour, it's relatively easy to achieve the EPA highway rating in this vehicle. The Nissan Leaf is an interesting exercise, not just in inexpensive electric transportation, but also sort of EV minimalism, I guess you could say. This has less than half the battery pack on board than you'll find in the average longer range EV. If you don't really need 300 miles of range, and you really only need about 40 or 50 miles of range every day, something like the base version of this at $28,000 could be a really great option for you. Again, if you qualify for any portion of that federal tax credit, you could get down to about $25,000 plus destination for the base version of LEAF. You get a very practical vehicle with a big cargo area in the back and an interior that is roughly similar to a gasoline vehicle with a similar price tag. Things are a little bit different with something like the Chevy Bolt. The Chevy Bolt also qualifies for a portion of the tax credit, but it is decently smaller than this, especially in the cargo area in the back. It is quite a bit smaller. It's a subcompact vehicle, and this is a bit more size similar to a Subaru Crosstrek or a Subaru Impreza hatch. It's actually right about that same size in pretty much every dimension, including the cargo area, which is right around there, actually a little bit bigger than we find in the current generation Subaru Crosstrek. 
any way you slice it, even the top end version of this, however, is going to be a lot less expensive than a newer battery electric vehicle, one that uh, seems to be getting all the headlines, like again, our EV of the year winner, the 2023 EV6. Don't get me wrong, I love the EV6, but this particular model was about $60,000. And of course, this is really hot right now, so people are marking them up $5,000, $10,000. The sky seems to be the limit. The Nissan Leaf, on the other hand, is much more attainable, and a vehicle like that EV6 wouldn't get any federal tax credit at all. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. Are you willing to live with something that has shorter range, slower charging, less available DC fast charging, etc., like this because of maybe some of those environmental concerns about using fewer resources to build and, of course, that lower sticker price to boot? Or are you just willing to spend the money to get all of the bells and whistles? When it comes to DC fast charging the Leaf, there are a few considerations to keep in mind and a few reasons you might want to choose some of the other options that are a bit more expensive. This doesn't have active battery cooling, so DC fast charging the LEAF may or may not cause greater battery degradation depending on exactly what you're doing. Also, this again uses the older Chatamo charging style connector in the United States. While that is still all the rage in Japan, in the United States pretty much everybody has moved over to CCS. Almost all of the new charging stations that are going in around the country are just supporting CCS, although Electrify America has given some lip service, I guess you might say, to Chatamo. There are a few of them out there. You can find them, but you'd be really hard pressed to find one that can charge this any faster than 50 kilowatts. To be honest, that should be just fine for most uses. In fact, during my ownership cycle with the Kia EV6, I have taken some road trips. I probably could have made that work in the Nissan Leaf, but it would have meant spending maybe about 45 minutes longer to charge going from Northern California to Southern California. That's not the end of the world. It is entirely doable. And the question, of course, would be, is that 45 minute time and reducing that down to about 10 minutes or so worth about $30,000 uh, or even for a close competitor to this that could charge appreciably faster on CCS, it's going to be at least about $15,000 more than something like this Nissan Leaf. Let me know down there in the comment section and of course check out our related content. Let me know if you want to see more videos like this or if you don't like this format, find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those other places. We'll see all of you next week.